Okay, welcome back. So we now have a more active panel discussion. So we more had some informative sessions uh, and now we turn to a sort of active panel discussion on how to establish liquid Euro SDR markets. Uh, I'm very happy to see that most of you come, came back uh, after uh, <laughs> this informative session, which means that I think we can be feel comfortable that a lot of institutions actually already started the preparations. Some of them, or some of you, I think, have flown, flown back to your institutions to start the preparations, but most of you are here, so that's, that's very helpful. Uh, so this is more a panel discussion, uh, uh, but we also have some possibility for uh, questions and answers after I ask some questions to these panelists. So the topic is more on how do we now actually come to liquid ester or Euro SDR markets. I will make this mistake quite often, uh, Holger will <laughs> probably. But yeah, I think we heard in various speeches and publications already that it's very important that we have liquid Euro SDR markets uh, and that, is, that it is crucial for the transition. This panel uh, discussion is, okay, how can we come to such a liquid market in which I think we have some, some important panelists and which roles can they play in this, in this establishment. Uh, for this purpose, we have, I think, a very good panel, a very nice panel. So we have Ankur Anea, uh, head of Euro rates trading at Barclays. Uh, Barclays is very active as a market maker in, in swaps, but also as a user, and also very active in the Sonia working group, which they are actually chairing. So I think a very good addition to our panel. We have Antonio Cavarero, uh, uh, coming from Generali Insurance Asset Management, so finally a non-bank. So what is happening to the asset management industry with this transition and also uh, with the potential fallback to Euribor. We have Andreas Franke, uh, Head of Risk Methodology, OTC and Eurish Clearing. Uh, so we also have a clearing house uh, in the house, which is also a, a very important to get a liquid Euro SDR market. Uh, then we have Thomas Schroeder, Deputy Head of Division Capital Markets at European Investment Bank. Uh, and that is a very active issuer in risk-free rates. And then we still have Holger, Holger Neuhaus. Uh, I already jokingly said, yeah, he's a little bit the founder of the Euro SDR with his department. Uh, <laughs> and, but he's, so he's, he's also an administrator. He's an observer in our working group. Uh, ECB is a regulator, ECB is responsible for monetary operations. So all questions in the end, in the end can be answered by Holger, I would expect. <laughs> Let's start with a very important question to a little bit set the scene of this panel discussion. Uh, so we all think it's very important that we have these liquid markets, Holger. Uh, uh, why? Why is that the case? Why do we actually need liquid Euro SDR markets, and especially in the derivative area? Yeah, I, th I think that actually the, the answer to this is even I mean, corresponds to the, to the mandate even of the working group because, uh, because there was, I mean, the, the mandate to actually have a new risk-free rate um, and to help manage the transition to it and then, of course, to have the fallbacks for Uriba. And if one looks in particular at the first part, so the recommendation is clearly made and now is the transition from Ionia to the Euro SDR, to the ECB Euro short-term rate. Um, that rate will be available as of 2nd of October and is ready to be used for everybody in contracts. So that's the easy part. But in the previous panel, I mean, there were many slides on what it takes and how a union is used. And the one is in the contracts, but then there are many other purposes where it's used. So it's used for valuations, discounting, uh, you name it. So you saw it's, it's also used in risk management, uh, really for accounting purposes, um, so that in order to effectively replace Ionia, uh, all of this will have to be carried out also in the future. And for that, an OIS market, uh, for example, will be a derivative market on that to hedge everything and to use it will be actually of, of key importance. Um, that is one of the points, so that the Euro SDR derivative market so really will be useful, if not decisive, for that transition to be very successful. Uh, another, another thing is that also for the fallback rates on Euribor, so one can always, one can always use the 
observed data, or what people call the backward-looking part. But then, of course, there's also one can also use then a forward-looking based on OIS. So if one wants to have that, it is, has to be based on a very liquid derivative market to be able uh, for everybody to calculate and to use it. So whoever hopes for, for this and is uh, expecting this to take place, I mean, they will need actually uh, that the derivative market is, uh, is building up. And of course, then there's also the link between the cash market and the derivative market. So both can be very helpful for each other so that actually the derivative market can help with the issuance, but of course also the other way around that really issuance can help the derivative markets. And all of that is, I mean, that's where, where I'm very happy uh, that this, I mean, there are some encouraging signs that actually market participants are looking into issuance, are looking at the details, what do I have to do in order for the derivative market to take off? And then, of course, also then that the, uh, the biggest clearers have already announced that uh, they will take, take action so that in October and as of November, so the first will actually be able to clear then the derivatives. Very clear. So I think it's, it's, it's really a prerequisite to make this whole transition a success. Antonio, as a, a, as a user, what could you do and what do you think are important conditions and drivers to come to such a liquid market? If I can answer to a question with a question, uh, I would say what is the central element of finance, of any financial transaction everywhere, anywhere in the business, uh, from the local branch to the most complex uh, derivative transaction, at the very end, the central element is trust. And the nothing, nothing can happen without trust. And uh, what can be the fundament, the, 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 the foundations of trust uh, when looking at, uh, at, uh, at the benchmark, like, uh, like uh, uh, Euro SDR, I will not say Esther. Um, the, first one is, uh, the first one is credibility. This parameter, this benchmark has to be credible, needs to be able to reflect um, uh, actual market conditions needs to be seen as a, and be solid and consistent with the, with the underlying market. These are elements that also Mr. Couret uh, mentioned at the very beginning, uh, mentioning how uh, Esther fully reflected and correctly reflected the recent uh, uh, rate cut uh, of, a, of a few weeks ago. Uh, another element that is key for another foundation for, for the trust that the market can have uh, into, into your SDR is the sustainability means being sustainable uh, during the transition. So having a framework of, uh, of rules and protocols uh, able to move from Ionia to uh, um, uh, uh, you, oops, uh, your SDR. Uh, and uh, also market sustainability, so being able to go through the different phases that markets can have. So now we are testing uh, a benchmark in the current market conditions. It needs to be reliable and trust and uh, and uh, trustworthy. Also, when market conditions uh, will be will be different, even if I don't know when. Um, another element that is important is having clarity about uh, the the transition period uh, details. So knowing. Uh, when uh, Aonia will cease to, uh, to exist for good, uh, and uh, uh, clearly there is, a, there is a, time, uh, a time table here that is very well uh, established and clear that actually is, uh, is long enough uh, to let people uh, adjust, uh, but is not too long uh, not to be credible. And having uh, for a while uh, a fallback plan, and, uh, and uh, here I, I want to repeat what has been said already before, people need to get ready because uh, uh, at some point the ONIA will, will cease to exist. So it is important that everybody uh, understand this beyond uh, uh, the, the uh, 2021. Uh, another element, uh, one more element is uh, communication and education. And this is actually what we're doing today, is try to make uh, the full com uh, financial community aware that something big is gonna happen, something very pervasive is gonna happen, something that is is will affect uh, uh, several aspects of all, all our businesses, IT, accounting, uh, risk management, so on and so forth. Uh, this is happening in a wider reform season uh, across other benchmarks, across other currencies. So education and communication are, are, are key. And then one, one last element, uh, and probably is the most delicate one, and even here this topic has been already mentioned uh, in, uh, in the previous panel, is uh, clarify the impacts uh, on, uh, on derivative uh, markets and uh, all, the, all the valuation sides. On that side, uh, the, the, the clearing uh, on uh, URSTR is gonna happen. 
the element uh, of uh, uh, the curve discounting uh, is probably one of the most uh, uh, delicate topics that needs to be to be addressed. Once all these elements, all these boxes are ticked, uh, we can probably say that the uh, URSTR has all the elements uh, to be uh, uh, trustworthy and as such to become liquid. Thank you very much. So credibility, sustainability, clarity and communication. Nice buzzwords that we can use <laughs> for this. Uh, as long as you give me the copyrights, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so thinking about you as being a little bit the father of Esther, that the, the 2nd of October would be the birth of your, I think you announced it as a girl, uh, a daughter then, uh, so big day. What are the plans still to, uh, to promote the adoption of the Euro SDR? Uh, are there even any regulatory levers that you could use to, to, to yeah, uh, install a proper implementation? Well, actually, I should say that in contrast to a German saying, the success is many fathers and mothers. So it's uh, not, <laughs> not, not, certainly not that I'm alone. So actually, basically in order to, I mean, to meet one of the criteria that Antonio has already mentioned, so to have, I mean, to have liquid, liquid derivative markets, the necessary condition is that there is a credible rate. So that has been really a key part of our job so far, so that we had carefully looked at the robust methodology, looked for endorsement of that, and now made everything possible so that we can be as sure as we can be on that, that this will be a, a reliable benchmark, which will be based on the contributions of the banks who submit us data for statistical purposes. So that's the first one. So and as of 2nd of October, the data, I mean, both the current one and also historical data will be available on the ECB's website to be used. So that's, I think, is a necessary condition for a liquidity market to take off. So the second one is, of course, also lies in what the working group on risk rate has recommended. So there have been, uh, you saw just the tip of the iceberg of the recommendations in the last panel. You are here in the room aware that there are many more details on, on that one. So really, recommendation to everybody to really look into the recommendation and following the up on them for implementing them as soon as possible. So that's also, also very important. Then the question on whether there are regulatory incentives or so, I mean, that's, I mean, that's a bit more difficult because contrary to the belief, I mean, in the central bank and the market operations part of the ECB, so we are not really regulators. Uh, so I cannot speak for the banking supervisors, nor can I speak actually for the supervisors and regulators of the, of the derivative markets or for, for the competent authorities under the benchmark regulation. However, uh, a crucial point has already been made actually by Stephen Mayor before, so that of course supervisors will have a careful look that supervised institutions will have robust fallbacks. That's, all, that's already a ver also a very important part of that. I mean, it's in the interest uh, of all these institutions. And not a detail, it's a legal requirement. So that's, that's also important. Uh, from a central bank perspective, so one interesting aspect there is actually an idea that the Bank of England had in their public consultation uh, in the discussion paper, so on the risk management approach to collateral referencing, uh, in their case, LIBOR. Because what they, I mean, one of the proposals there is that any collateral that is being put forward has to have robust uh, fallbacks. So that's an important part. So if I take that perspective of a market participant, so basically whenever you want to in particular use, but in particular receive, of course, collateral, or uh, if you want to place it with a central bank or if you're issuing it, so you want to be sure that fallbacks are uh, in place. So uh, that would be that would be things which will, will help there. Let's then go to the, the clearinghouse. So I think it's yeah, very important that we see the right products also in the, the clearinghouses. Uh, otherwise, yeah, the market will not take off, that's a clear. Uh, so the product offering of, of yeah, important clearinghouses like Eurex is crucial. Can you shed some lights on the plans of Eurex around the Euro SDR products, uh, Andreas? Yeah, happy, happy to do so. But before I talk about new products, I think one, one thing is important has been mentioned a few times, and that's the, that's the trust, the trust aspect. And the trust aspect um, in terms of the transition, not only in terms of that we can launch new products, but also that we can digest 
all the changes that are upcoming and that will be happening also next week. So number one priority for us is always to make sure that the existing positions, at the end of the day, it's your positions are transitioned smoothly across all of the various stages of the transition. So I think that's, uh, that's very clear and that needs to be, uh, I think, put at the, at, the numbers more, uh, at the number one spot that uh, existing positions are always highest priority. Then if you look at which products are actually affected by the, uh, by the changes that are, that are upcoming, um, then you can see also in which areas you would expect to see new products. So, and that really ranges across a whole uh, spectrum of asset classes. It's not only the swap side, it's, uh, it's really uh, a whole spectrum of, uh, of things that will change. And, and that starts, for example, on the equity side with certain derivatives, uh, futures on the equities market like total return futures and, and variance futures, which also embed certain references to Ionia, for example, where we will, uh, over uh, the next uh, months, uh, replace them with uh, references to uh, explicit references to Euro SDR or Euro SDR plus plus eight and a half, depending on uh, what the what the contract is. Um, and then it goes to Ionia futures. I mean, Ionia futures are not the uh, um, uh, let's say uh, most liquid uh, product uh, in the market, but obviously also there is a is a significant impact uh, due to the recalibration. And on that side, I mean, we will transition that that product as well, uh, but then we will. You know, after after the first phase of the transition has been has been digested, uh, also look to launch uh, Esther futures. So not the implicit one via the Ionia, but the explicit Esther futures. But this is a process that that will also require the the, the right go to market approach for that product, because just simply having a new listing on an exchange doesn't it doesn't really uh, doesn't really help, yeah, especially for a product that does not trade. Um, and then I think one thing that's very important when you talk about uh, also the cash markets and it's, it's all the, the repo space uh, that we uh, that we um, uh, that we offer. So uh, and there um, we will also make sure that we offer um, uh, repos that are floating linked uh, to uh, to Euro STR so that you can uh, then uh, by start of next week if you want to do an, a repo transaction that's floating against Euro STR you can uh, you can do that. Um, and then on the collateral side, uh, I mean, we will uh, also, um, well, we're working towards adding uh, Euro STR as, a, as an index to the eligibility spectrum of, uh, of collateral that we, that we take. Um, the, the index is only one component of the eligibility, so there, there are more criteria uh, there, but we will add that there so that if there is a, a, a bond that we, uh, we can also accept that as, uh, as collateral. And then comes the, uh, the uh, OTC derivative space. Uh, um, and there I must say, we actually already clear Esther. Because every reference to Ionia starting already probably some time ago and uh, most, uh, most prominently starting next week is, is essentially the same market. It's, it's Esther plus eight and a half. So when you think about doing a, doing a swap, you probably think about uh, um, uh, also, uh, you need to think about Esther uh, uh, because Ionia is essentially Esther. So that's, that's one thing. Um, but clearly the future is not Ionia uh, swaps. The future is Esther swaps, and hence we will uh, allow that for clearing uh, November 18th, uh, and we will allow Esther overnight index swaps and uh, Euribo Esther uh, basis swaps out to uh, roughly 50 years. Okay, thank you a lot. Ankur, can the way this transi transition is set up in, in, in two stages eh, uh, help to support liquidity in the Euro SCR markets? Um. It's not going to hurt liquidity, so I think, um, yeah, I think it, it is going to help liquidity um, on, on several fronts. Firstly, the transition is is, is somewhat seamless, where you're, you're um, as Andreas mentioned, Ionia is now a tracker index, or will be a tracker index to Esther. So, you are indirectly moving liquidity from Ionia to Esther, and, and I think that will allow banks such as ourselves to prepare in. Um, in an efficient and effective manner. And the second stage being is the discontinuation of Ionia. And as we approach, approach that second stage, um, we'll see more direct, uh, and, and once we get, the market gets more confidence in the Euro STR uh, index or, uh, or um, <coughs> derivatives based off this index, we'll see more liquidity gravitate directly towards this index. So I think the Time at time and, and these multiple stages will absolutely help liquidity. 
The other thing is, I was reminded in, 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 the, last, um, in the last panel that was up before us was if you look at that checklist, checklist of resources, it, it is somewhat daunting when you look at that checklist of resources. And, and I, I think I could speak for a lot of people in this room when, when I say that resources are, not, resources are often scarce at institutions that we work at. And what I mean by that is, is by, by having this broken down into a two-stage process, and that two-stage process can be broken down into multiple stages, which <coughs> I think that this is a thoughtful transition whereby you can break that process down into multiple processes. Take, for example, the settlement of, of uh, you know, Ionia from T to T plus one. And you can, you can, we can allow our resources to focus on these various sub-process and sub-processes, and whereby allowing us to efficiently and effectively migrate towards uh, Euro STR. And all this helps liquidity. I think it'll be very, um, very good for liquidity over a medium to long-term horizon. Thank you. Thomas, as, a, as, a, as an issue or uh, as a first step, of course, Ionia will be recalibrated to Euro STR, uh, but will still be available until the end of 2021. Do you expect that market participants in this stage will still continue to transact on the basis of Ionia, or would you expect a, a, a real direct shift to Euro STR? Well, I think first thing is it's, it's very much a similar thing to start with, at least for the, for the first two years. So it depends largely on the um, on the preparedness of the institution, whether <coughs> you've taken built, built your systems around Esther and you can uh, about your SDR. Sorry, <laughs> um, uh, that that that's more the question. So I would say more more sophisticated institutions would probably move early and, and some others a bit later. But I think there's a hard deadline at the end of 2021. Uh, at which everybody has to uh, to uh, to move uh, to uh, Euro SDR. Um, we have um, some areas like uh, well, transactions longer than uh, 2021 maturity uh, generally have a problem, and that's clearly uh, necessary to uh, to move directly to a Euro SDR or at least to have a fallback uh, into Euro SDR. Um, and, uh, and, and there's also the derivatives market. In the derivatives market, we have the collateral uh, uh, remuneration rate, which is often Eonia. That, I can expect, uh, might, might uh, wait a bit um, for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for the CCPs to, uh, to fully, fully endorse uh, your STR to be the, uh, the rate, the, the discount rate, uh, <coughs> because basically the kind of remuneration rate at uh, CCPs have some kind of bearing also on remuneration rates of OTC uh, derivatives transactions. Um, well, I said there are different, there's different timing probably uh, in, in, the, in the financial uh, world about when to move to USDR. But we, for example, us at European Investment Bank, we have announced last week the first uh, Euro STR based uh, floating rate bond transaction. Uh, that is, uh, well, we're still building, uh, building the interest, uh, but, but it looks like that we uh, would, would uh, uh, basically launch this transaction uh, in the coming, coming days. And uh, so to, um, uh, to, to, use, uh, to use the first uh, kind of fixings of Euro, Euro STR, which start on the 2nd of October. So probably the settlement date is then about a week later because we have a five business days look back period, uh, a kind of standard which we have been setting on uh, other transactions in other currencies already in the past. Uh, last summer, uh, well, in summer 2018, we should uh, Sterling Sonia floating rate transactions followed by several uh, thereafter. Um, and uh, in, in, in the US, the so far is a similar situation. So we would hope to establish here um, uh, liquidity also on the bond side, on the, on the cash and <coughs> um, very early on. Um, and specifically that trade, uh, it was never thought of doing an Eonia floating rate bond at this stage. It was clearly meant to be a, a, a new uh, format bond to support the transition. Okay, and for the transition that actually mature beyond 2021, well, uh, Do you expect that market participants yeah, we, will we, wait? I think we have not fully decided is it a two or three year transaction. Uh, and uh, I, I was not able to get any update this morning uh, whether it's a two year or three year, but that makes the difference. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a two year, we could normally get away with Eonia. But if it's a three year, it's, it, it would be required. But in any case, it will be an, a Euro SDR bond. Yeah. Do you expect that market participants, yeah, the ones that have contracts that mature beyond 
2021 on Aonia that they will simply await the final deadline or that they will make the transaction or the transition in an earlier stage? I think it's, I think it's, a, bit, it's, 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 it's a bit risky to wait too long because everybody knows the, uh, the, fallback, uh, the fallback wording on uh, legacy transactions, uh, be it on, uh, on, on, on the various eyeballs or be it on, on Aonia, and is, uh, is not perfect or, or, say, relatively poor. So we, ne we need to uh, have strong fallbacks for permanent succession of the uh, benchmark index, which we don't have in many legacy contracts. So that's a big task for, for all of us to, uh, to go through uh, the, uh, to our books and, and see where such contracts are, particularly if they are longer than uh, 2021. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, so maybe Anko Buckley, of course, is very active as a market maker and, and, and also as a user of benchmarks. Uh, uh, so you live and breathe derivative markets, I would say. Mm -hmm. What do you expect about the, the future liquidity in the Euro SDR derivative market? Um, yeah, I think liquidity is going to pick up over a medium to long term horizon. I think. Um, I wouldn't expect X, uh, Euro STR. I, I keep saying Esther, so I didn't read the memo until yesterday on, on <laughs> Esther. Um, but uh, I don't think it's, you're going to see a flurry of activity directly linked towards Esther next week. I think the market's going to be looking at various things to gain confidence in this new, in this new benchmark um, and, and to get the resources and to get their houses in line. So a couple things the market will be looking at, in my opinion, are you know, are going to be looking at uh, issuance, um, you know, Euro, Euro STR issuance, for, for instance. So they'll be looking at, very importantly, they'll be looking at tiering, what the effect of, what the effect uh, tiering has on the Euro STR um, uh, fixing and the volatility of that underlying fixing. So as confidence is, as confidence is over time um, Increased in the in, in, in these uh, in these elements of, of this new of this new benchmark that's being introduced into the ecosystem of, of banks and institutions um, across Europe, people will people will start gravitating towards this, and as a result, we'll see an improved um, end user demand, and which will result in better liquidity, and and it'll be it'll become a a positive feedback loop, in my opinion. And I think that could happen very, very quickly. And I think looking at sterling, for instance, we've seen that happen very quickly. So I, I do think that we'll see activity pick up um, uh, over a medium to long-term horizon, but that can happen quite, quite sharply. So, Hogo, you can expect a fast-growing daughter then. Uh, that's, that's interesting. And uh, maybe, maybe Andreas, uh, so one of the important and crucial drivers for such a transition is, of course, what, what the clearinghouses will do for PAI and, and the discounting uh, regime. <coughs> uh, that is expected to force liquidity to Euro SDR markets. Uh, what are your expectations? Uh, you can do it too quickly, you can wait too long. What, 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 what are the plans? <coughs> well, I mean, I mean, I hear that a lot. We've mentioned it a few times already on this panel, on earlier panels as well. And also, if you talk to, to the market, that's, that's an important thing. And, we, and, the, and, the, and I think the first message is we fully understand that. And we take this very, very serious with highest priority to get it right, to get it as right as possible. There's probably not one right, but there might be multiple rights. I think that's, that's one thing, just to, to kick that off. And when you think about discounting, I think that the first thing that you, that you need to do is to define like, what's actually my target discounting regime. Which rate do I want to apply? I mean, I could simply say, well, Leone is Esther plus 8.5, so I use that. Then I don't have any, let's say, value transfer or, or any of the complications that, that arise out of the uh, other choices. Uh, and that's been highlighted also in the, uh, in the, various, in the various reports. But we believe that um, in order to call this transition a success and to really have a market that's ester based um, that we will target a, a discounting and PI regime that is ester flat Now, when you say that, what does that mean? That means that your curves for discounting go from Ionia to ester And that means somewhere of the order of 8.5 basis points will your curves shift. And that creates a dependency of all valuations in the market essentially on this move. Not only Ionia swaps, but all your RIBO swaps, uh, inflation swaps, everything that's in Euro that is discounted of Ionia today will then experience a change in the NPV. And that creates 
if you just do that, that creates winners and losers, and that's clearly not what we want uh, to, to, to do. We don't, don't want uh, this uh, to create winners and losers, so we need to mitigate that somehow. And then you, you need to start to think about, okay, how do you actually organize, organize, that, uh, organize that process? Um, and I mean, one question is like, yeah, okay, so why can't you just say date? Uh, what's, what's taking so long? And I think uh, what, what I would try to do before I get into maybe more, more concrete, uh, concrete things, you know, what are actually the key considerations that we need to, to think of when we, when we approach this? And, and I would say there are, there are three, three areas, three main areas. One is stakeholder alignment. The second one is the market and infrastructure readiness for ESTA. And the last one is then how do you actually roll it out in terms of transparency, methodology, and last but not least, then also the timing uh, perspective. Now, if we go from, from top to bottom there, the alignment piece, I mean, what, what are the stakeholders uh, of, of a CCP typically? Well, it's the market, it's, it's uh, our members, uh, and it's the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the regulators that, that supervise us. So that's the classical uh, um, uh, high-level picture of this, the stakeholders. But in this case, um, when you look at, at the recommendations as well, uh, there's a third stakeholder, and that's actually the CCP community, because there's a clear desire to have this aligned across CCPs, um, and this is uh, something uh, that is, that is a, a bit unusual in the sense that uh, these are, you know, all, all CCPs are in a way competitors and we have to comply to competition law at all times. Um, so uh, the way that we, uh, that we uh, achieve that um, uh, is, uh, is not a straightforward process and we need to find a transparent way um, how to do that. Um, and uh, I mean, one thing that we um, uh, that we believe is that that involving industry associations, industry associations like uh, like the European Association of, of Clearing Houses could uh, could help uh, to facilitate um, uh, that uh, that process. But that needs to be ironed out uh, further. So I think that's uh, that's just um, that's uh, just starting. And then on the on the member side, so what what we've been doing over the uh, the last uh, um, uh, four to four to six months is. Uh, we've started uh, active uh, engagement with our members to discuss all aspects uh, of the transition, not only the discounting switch, but this is currently uh, the focus there um, uh, to really uh, look at uh, um, what, the, what the opinions are in that regard. Um, and th but that's still on, ongoing, so that's not a, not, not a finalized process. But one thing that we also need to keep in mind, obviously, is that we have a very broad member base. We not only have the, the large or the medium-sized banks, it's quite broad. And we have to make sure that at the end of the process, nobody's left behind, right? I think that's, uh, that's also an important aspect also when it comes to the, uh, to the trust uh, aspect. And then the second one is readiness. Okay, I mean, one thing that, uh, um, uh, that we obviously need to, to take into account is if we base all of our valuations on a new curve, then we need to trust that curve in a way, right? So there needs to be a certain um, a sense of readiness to transact ESTA derivatives uh, in, in the market uh, before we can actually you know, base everything on it. I mean, uh, one of the purposes of a CCP is to organize uh, uh, and to shield non-defaulters uh, from, from defaulters in a, in, a, in a crisis scenario. And then you need to be sure you can actually transact on what you are pricing your trades off, i.e., um, uh, that's something that, that we also need to be uh, looking for. And uh, I think the next months are going to be very interesting, uh, very interesting in that regard, and we need to uh, monitor that, uh, that closely. But I think w one message there is uh, here it's really something we are part of this ecosystem, but we're all together in this. We need to, to move together. Like no action is actually no option. I think that's, uh, that's one of the key uh, messages there. And then maybe uh, the very briefly, a bit on the, on, the, uh, on the rollout side. So on the transparency aspect, and I think that's, uh, that's also been mentioned a few times, what we'll be start doing is uh, by uh, November 18th, we will uh, provide every member uh, undiscriminatory access to information such as how do my values change if I was discounting ESTA. I will not use ESTA curves. Uh, for actual valuations, but we will provide you with all the information that you need to say, okay, my trades would go from NPVA to NPVB. My deltas would change from there to there. 
so that everybody, yeah, and that might be uh, more straightforward for, for larger institutions to, uh, to, uh, to cope with, uh, but that everybody has the option uh, to look at that. Um, and then I think um, what we will also need to do is provide transparency on how we think about the, the actual switch methodology because when you talk about timing, I mean, you could also say, okay, what's the actual important thing to know how we are going to switch at a certain point in time or that we are going to switch at that point in time? I think it's also the how part that's important. So once that is, uh, once that is more stable, I think, uh, then we can also provide transparency there and uh, maybe um, uh, start, uh, start the, the process there. Um, and obviously, when you talk about, about that, then it's a matter of compensation, right? Um, so uh, we believe compensation has to, be, has to be done because you change the curves. Um, and uh, we agree with the working group recommendation that a cash-only Compensation is, uh, has many advantages, and that uh, our plan would be currently to go, to go down that route. But now comes the big question, okay, fair enough, when do you actually do it, right? So, um, uh, um, and I, I, can't give you, I can't give you a concrete date, so I'm too, uh, disappointed in, 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 that, in that sense. But I hope what I, what, I, what I said, that provides some clarity around all of the things that we need to think about, and at the end of the day, it will be a matter of striking the right balance between all of these, uh, between all of these aspects. Um, and, but again, we agree with the working group that, it's, that momentum is important, right? Uh, and so a switch that has a 2020 timestamp on it should probably uh, achieve the momentum uh, piece. Um, and when you, but when you look at the calendar for next year, I mean, then, then it's already quite full, right? So at the beginning of the year will be Esther building up and then you, we don't know what's going to happen with, uh, with Brexit, how that's going to play out, and then you are already somewhere in Q2. Yeah, so uh, I would say that you know, then the June date uh, might be something that, uh, um, uh, that is still in, in a way free. Yeah? And then you have uh, other clearing houses uh, switching US dollar trades then also throughout the year, and there are other things going on, so uh, you will probably want to avoid holidays. Yeah? Um, so uh, that brings you then sometime to September or November. So those are, I would say, corridors that I could currently envisage if we just look at what we can influence. But again, the alignment across CCPs is not factored in and it's very hard to judge how that will at the end impact uh, those considerations. Yeah, one of the other elements that we of course look at is that we also try to use you as an example for the bilateral contract. Yeah. So, so we hope it's not too late in the process. So it's, 2020 sounds very good. Uh, but 2021 would have already become, a, become an issue uh, there. So thanks a lot. Yeah, I think very, very clear. Uh, yeah, Thomas, you already mentioned that, that the, 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 the recent announced uh, issuance of, of EURSDR in an early stage, uh, just before, before it's actually being published. Uh, yeah, quite brave as an issuer. What, what are your expectations? Because you did this before, eh? you did the issuances in, in, in other risk fee rates. Uh, what are our expectations about book build? The one? Well, well, Very difficult, of course. Yeah, we, in, in general, we are a, f a frequent bond issuer in, in, in various markets, and Euro, the euro market is the biggest for, for us and the most important. So um, we have, since the, uh, the, the, since the uh, international benchmark reforms um, started, we have been looking at, uh, at new alternative uh, risk free rates. And as I already mentioned, we have issued uh, Sterling, Sonia, and uh, Sofer uh, last year already. Um, I, and, and we work on the euro trade. I think what's quite important in these transactions is that we, and which might some some elements not everybody has seen. Uh, we've done some even some test trades. We've even done some very small test trades with real money, uh, but, let's say one million or so or two, uh, and so to, to so to the uh, book runners. Uh, so that they kept capture the transaction, uh, they, they did some trades in the secondary market. So we really tested uh, the, the, the whole process because there are a number of, um, of new elements related to that. The typical floating rate market, bond market, is based on IBORs, dollar LIBOR, sterling LIBOR, EURIBOR, three months typically. And uh, moving to uh, overnight rates means we have to deal with uh, compounding and uh, we have to implement well the calendar uh, effect because we need to finish fixing a few days, say five business days before payments for operational reasons. 
So this all needs to be implemented. Uh, and uh, everywhere, on Bloomberg, on Reuters, on, uh, on the various uh, back office, middle office systems, so that everybody can deal with these things. And I'm not talking only on the issuer side, but basically everybody wants to touch these bonds. And, and that has been carefully uh, prepared, and, and that took a took huge, uh, huge of time to get this, get this done. So we have issued already some, uh, some uh, euro or risk-free rate issuance uh, on, on a testing level, even if uh, ESTA is not there yet. But we've used some uh, pre-ESTA uh, fixings uh, to, 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 but really uh, to, to do the test of transaction. And now we're uh, working on the benchmark transaction. Benchmark, what does it mean? Typically a billion, but uh, the size is not announced yet, but that's the typical benchmark transaction, uh, which was so in sterling, it was so in dollars, it might, might so be in, in euros as well. And, um, and I, I think that's, uh, besides the exact structuring of the bond, that's quite uh, important to really test the Think through, yeah, and that's again uh, also basically for for most of you, you have to uh, look st through all your systems to get 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 that right and get that prepared. Yeah, even if there's Aonia available at this moment, but two years is not a long time, so this needs really uh, to be prepared. Uh, and okay, and. For us, I think we, we see these transactions as not a one-off transaction. We see it as really a starting point of a, an issuance program uh, for us and, and hopefully which works well with the market. So it's very important for us that uh, our bond transactions uh, go well with the uh, derivatives market. So we, uh, we have compounding first comp and then, and then the added, adding the spread. For, it's one of the elements. Uh, to, to be in line with OIS market, uh, and uh, so we we try to be uh, to, to pr produce a product which is really uh, meant to stay there and, and which which meant to which uh, can, uh, which others might use as well yeah, in, the, in that form. Yeah. Thank you. Antonio, so we talk a lot about banks uh, because typically we are a bank, but what about the, the, the asset management side? What are your preparations and, and what do you do in the run-up to the go-life of, of uh, Aeonia uh, to Western transition? If I have Euro to, yeah, I think I heard that they're going to put like one the euro fine for every time. <laughs> you know, just, just to let you know. Um, if I have to put a subtitle, uh, to this, uh, to this uh, uh, panel, to this uh, roundtable, would be work in progress. Uh, we've been talking so far about uh, uh, how much work is in progress uh, at, uh, at industry level, uh, and uh, here we have to thank uh, ECB and all the other stakeholders and participants that are pushing forward this very complex and very pervasive topic. Uh, but the same work in progress level can be applied uh, to what uh, uh, an animal, a fund billion plus animal is uh, uh, like General is doing. Um, we, have set, we have set already some time ago uh, internal uh, working groups. Uh, the one uh, uh, related to the investment and wealth management is actually led by my colleague Anna who was here. Uh, uh, before this morning, and another another component of this working group is sitting uh, is sitting uh, Fabio sitting in the in the audience. So we are carefully uh, going through all the aspects uh, of this uh, through the let's say the insurance front office side for what is for what is uh, is handled, but more importantly in the risk management side, uh, on the investment side in finance. So. The work in progress level is, uh, is uh, uh, applicable also to, to Generali. Uh, clearly with the aim to make sure that our infrastructure within the time window that is given to us uh, is ready to handle uh, uh, this, uh, this switch. Um, if I can pick uh, a couple of uh, elements where we look for support and inspiration from outside, and some of these topics have been already touched so far, are uh, um, inputs coming from the issuance. Uh, so we will look at uh, how the issuance side, the issuers will use uh, uh, the, new, uh, the new benchmark in their activity 
uh, because we are clearly on the on the on the buy side of that, uh, and as such, the the uh, uh, what has been said before uh, is very is very interesting to us. Um, another topic, Adam, another topic uh, that is very very important, but again, I'm repeating myself, is uh, the topic like regarding to the management of derivatives, discounting, so on and so forth. Again, nothing new, but is very very important uh, that we are all aware that that uh, that one is very is is really the 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 elephant in the room, and. More in general, we would be expecting and we look for any kind of, let's call it, uh, uh, common protocols at, at the industry level uh, uh, that make uh, easier uh, the dissemination of the information through our, uh, our structures, our companies, our groups, because many people need to be really educated uh, about something that is not that common to happen. It, it doesn't happen very, very often in your life that you have to do uh, a switch like this. So we are in, in the run-up. We are doing. We are. Uh, we have this. Uh, this. Uh, these uh, working groups. Uh, um, and uh, we will keep on uh, participating in this kind of uh, initiatives in order to, to keep on learning. Thanks. So I think we are running out of time. Maybe one last question to Holger, since we are in your house, so maybe give you the last floor. The, the, uh, yeah, the situation around uh, uh, LIBOR and URIBOR is different. Eh? So uh, LIBOR is really, uh, uh, will cease to exist, while URIBOR will still be sustainable. Uh, so we have a different situation. We really work to fallbacks to Euribor. Do you believe there is sufficient room in the euro market to have actually yeah, still the credit-based benchmark Euribor next to the new benchmarks uh, based on the euro STR? Okay, I, I think you actually did not bluff when you said there will be difficult questions to me. Um, <laughs> And you even asked me two for the price of one. So actually, if I think of that, so what you asked me now are two questions. The one question is, is there actually room for instruments or derivatives based on both EURSTR and URIBOR? And the second question is, uh, uh, and the, the second question is, is whether one actually needs uh, EURSTR OIS rates actually as a benchmark in addition to actually Euro SDR itself, observed Euro SDR values. So on the first question, um, I think there, if, okay, if I look at past evidence, historical evidence, I mean, in the past we did have a situation when we had a huge OIS market, uh, a very liquid one based on Ionia, and then we had actually liquid derivatives on Uriva. So, uh, so it did exist in the past. Now. Uh, trading patterns and the whole environment has, of course, changed a lot. So the past is not always the best predictor for the, for the future, but at least uh, that was what, what happened before. I'm also a bit unclear myself at this moment of uh, what will be the demand from the outside and also inside the euro area regarding cross-currency products. Uh, when other jurisdictions will use the risk-free rate, here there is also for term rates, so here is then, uh, then, then Euribor. When speaking to market participants active in that market, typically I get the reply, no, no, I mean everybody will use their own and uh, we can manage the basis risk. Actually, I do not doubt that at all. What I just do not know and where to get my head around and probably it's better and easier to monitor what will actually happen is whether end users will really want to have that complication. But okay, that remains to be seen. Um, on the second question, so would users really need another benchmark, so on, say, OIS, what is in the recommendations in case there's a forward-looking rate is wanted? So is, there, uh, is it useful to have actually a second benchmark based on Euro SCR? I, I, I'm not sure, so I think that verdict, uh, that verdict is out. And I would suggest, actually, for that case, uh, basically to see first, let's look at the derivative market and how it will be doing, because it's a necessary condition that it has to be liquid, it has to be active, so that actually such a benchmark could even be produced in a reliable way, a robust manner, et cetera. So I think that, is, that is, remains to be seen. At the same time, so as of next week, Euro SDR is there, the values will be there, the data is on the website, can be used whenever possible for fallbacks, and as other jurisdictions have shown, 
I mean, even instead of, of I mean, where they show that actually they use those rates even instead of IBO. So that, that I think is something we can see. Thank you. Maybe then it's time for you. Any questions from the audience? And I think that the, the rules still 